And welcome, I'm Letitia Diaz, I'm the Dean of the Law School, and I'd like to welcome everyone to Barry University Dueno Andreas School of Law. We are proud to host this collaborative presentation in our series on Aging with Dignity. We thank the University of Central Florida for sponsoring this event and welcome all presenters and participants. We know that you will find great value in our Aging with Dignity series. This semester, our law school broke ground in offering a guardianship course as part of our comprehensive course offerings in elder law. We praise the commitment of some of our other collaborators at the Ninth Judicial Circuit and the Orange County Council on Aging. At this point, I would like to welcome our own adjunct professor of law, Circuit Judge Jose Rodriguez. Thank you all. Thank you, Dean Diaz, and thanks for the opportunity to become involved in what's the most important part of what we do, which is to educate those as to what aging is about. Because you know, quite frankly, that's one thing we all have in common. None of us are gonna get out of this alive. And it is how we go through that trip through our lives and the value that we take with us that is of the utmost important. Again, thank you, Dean Diaz. Uh, welcome again to Barry University's Duane Andreas, Duane O. Andreas School of Law. Uh, again, it's a terrific opportunity for us to do collaborative work with the University of Central Florida. And this is a fourth in a series on aging with dignity. I wanna also express my gratitude to Tracy Wharton and the University of Central Florida without whose assistance and uh, sponsorship this meeting here, this seminar would not be possible. This or these series uh, or this series of aging with dignity is but I, will, I believe a first step that we are taking towards the creation of a center for elder justice and the protection of vulnerable persons. Our next opportunity will be to create a clinical internship program where law students and students from other law-related or adjunct-related uh, fields, such as social work, nursing, et cetera, will be able to volunteer to monitor wards, which I like and prefer to refer to them as protected persons, since the term ward doesn't really describe the individuals. So again, to make sure that we monitor the progress of protected persons, uh, of guardians, as well as to provide a measure of accountability. You may find this and other presentations for later reference by going to the Ninth Judicial Circuit website at ninthcircuit.org. It's the Ninth Circuit of Florida, not the Ninth Circuit of California. Ninthcircuit.org or the Barry University Law School website. It's being simulcast for those of you out there who couldn't be here present. We are using modern techniques, of course. So again, log in, check in, and if not, you can always see the video uh, presentation on demand at Orange TV, and we thank Orange TV also for carrying this uh, program. We hope you find it interesting and that you have quite a bit of takeaway of important information that's going to be passed along. This is a rare opportunity indeed, and again, enjoy. bring this down where I can actually speak into it. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to start by thanking Dean Diaz uh, for co-sponsoring this event and for making this beautiful facility available to all of us today to have this educational forum. And uh, special thanks also to Judge Rodriguez for his opening comments. Uh, my name is Bonnie Yegedis, and I'm director of the School of Social Work at the University of Central Florida. <clears throat> and we're thrilled to have this opportunity today to co-host this event. Uh, on understanding recent federal and state changes on aging and healthcare policy, something of uh, critical importance to all of us in the state of Florida and in the nation uh, that we live in. From our school, Dr. Tracy Wharton is a project leader, is the project leader, actually, of a five-year grant 
that UCF received from the Council on Social Work Education, which is the national crediting body for schools of social work, and the National Association of Social Workers, which of course is the largest advocacy organization of social work in the United States. And the program is known as HEALS. HEALS stands for Health Education and Leadership Scholars Program. This program, the one we have at UCF, is one of only 10 that are funded in the United States. So it was a very competitive proposal that we submitted and we secured, and Dr. Wharton is the project leader, and she has done an outstanding job uh, in, leading this, in leading this program. The program awards financial support for four students a year, two BSW students and two MSW students. <clears throat> and for the program, these students get, and several of them are here today, an enhanced curriculum focused on healthcare and healthcare policy, advocacy, and research. Under the leadership of Dr. Wharton, our students have had the opportunity to participate in legislative advocacy for healthcare at both the state and federal levels. We're about to graduate our 12th Heels Scholar later this week. Our graduation in the school is Friday and uh, the university's graduation for us is on Saturday. If you are one of our students who's a Heels Scholar, would you please stand? <laughs> so you can be recognized, yay. Thank you. We are very proud of all of you and that the work, work of, the, of our students over the last three years. And as I understand it from talking to Dr. Wharton, we'll soon be interviewing students for the HEALS program for next year. For today's educational program, we are honored to have with us the director of the National Council on Aging, Mr. Robert Blancato. We are also very fortunate to have the expertise of Ann Swirlick from the Florida Policy Institute on Aging and Healthcare Policy. I want to thank each of you, as well as Amy O'Rourke, who is sitting over here, uh, the president of Cameron Group Aging Life Care Services, for her willingness to facilitate the question and answer session for us today. Many thanks to all of our sponsors, including Orange County Government, and to each of our distinguished speakers. Uh, we're very grateful to have this opportunity to learn uh, with you and from you, and we're pleased that you have chosen to spend your time with us this afternoon. At this point, I'd like to invite Dr. Wharton to the podium. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm going to be really brief. I'm just going to introduce our speakers and then get out of the way. Um, I, I want to provide some brief introduction to our guests today. Um, their full bios can be found in your program. Um, and you were given uh, some note cards. Those note cards are, uh, it was mentioned before that we are live streaming this, hi, uh, and okay. videotaping. And so we want to be able to make sure that all of those questions that people have get read into the microphone. So the way we're going to do it is as the, as the program goes on, if you would write your questions on those note cards, and uh, I'll be around, and Mimi, who was standing at the back, uh, she will be, flag one of us down, and we will take those note cards from you and, um, and give them to our facilitator. Um, we will have two guests, as was mentioned, Mr. Bob Blancato and Ms. Ann Swirlick, followed by a question and answer session, um, which is going to be facilitated by Amy Cameron O'Rourke, who is the founder and president of the Cameron Group. We are very grateful to have her skills and her uh, insight to facilitate that part of the program. Um, <clears throat> Ann Swirlick, I'm going to introduce the second speaker first and the first speaker second. So, Ann Swirlick is an attorney and health policy analyst for the Florida Policy Institute. She has over 30 years of experience as a public interest attorney focusing on health, economic, and social justice issues. Prior to her employment with FPI, uh, she served as the policy director for Florida Chain, which is a statewide grassroots health advocacy organization promoting access to affordable and quality health care for all Floridians. Throughout most of her professional career, she's worked as a legal services attorney representing indigent clients on a broad range of poverty law issues. She received her BA from University of Virginia and her JD from Virginia School of Law and was admitted to the Florida Bar in 1977. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our first speaker, Mr. Blancato, is president of Matt's Blancato and Associates. He's the national coordinator for the bipartisan 3,000 member Elder Justice Coalition and executive director of the National Association of Nutrition and Aging 
um, <clears throat> services programs. I believe there were a couple of handouts, by the way, out there, so I hope that you grabbed those on the way in. If not, please grab them on the way out. One is from that group, I believe, um, and one from the Florida Policy Institute. Um, Bob has more than 20 years of service in the congressional and executive branches, including uh, as senior staff of the House Select Committee on Aging and an appointment by President Clinton to be executive director of the 1995 White House Conference on Aging. Uh, most recently, he's the immediate past chair of the Board of American Society uh, on Aging and uh, is on the National Board of AARP, as was mentioned. He also serves on the advisory panel on outreach and education on the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, lovingly known as CMS. He, recently, he was recently selected by Next Avenue as a 2016 influencer on aging and is a blogger for them writing about aging issues. Uh, he has a BA from Georgetown and an MPA from U American University. He's won numerous awards for advocacy, including, and I think this might be the coolest thing I've ever gotten to announce in somebody's bio, <laughs> being knighted by the Italian uh, Republic in 2011. I'm not kidding, it's totally in the bio. <laughs> So with that, I will get out of the way and turn over the podium to Mr. Boncana. Tracy, thank you very much. All right, how many Italian-Americans are in the room? Raise your hand. Any Italian-Americans? All right, that's good. Tracy, thank you very much um, for the introduction, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to be here in this wonderful program, and I have to figure out, let's see, let me hit a button here. Okay, so I'm going to keep this up for a minute just because a lot of times people say, can I have a copy of your slides? What did you say? What did you say on slide number 23? So there's an email address at the bottom for you to jot down while we begin this, this session. But I want to do my thank yous before I get into the text of things. I want to thank Tracy. I want to thank Mimi, who's back there, the incredibly organized Mimi, uh, who I have come to appreciate a great deal as this thing was getting underway. Uh, Judge Rodriguez, who was here. There he is. Judge, thank you very much for all you do and what have done, and it was wonderful to meet you by phone. Uh, Dean Diaz, uh, who may still be here, but we have a common bound. We found out that uh, my wife's from New Jersey and she's from New Jersey, and you know, two Jersey, two Jersey people getting together, you know, it's, it's serious. Uh, Dr. Yegedis, nice to talk with you and meet you earlier as well. Um, and Ann Swirlick, I look forward to uh, doing our session together later. And the scholars, congratulations. I met these guys before. Congratulations again. Come on, that's, good. that's a great honor. And, you know, and it's great to be with people in the noble profession of social work. How many social workers are in the room? Raise your hand. Okay, you deserve your own round of applause for pursuing. It's also nice to be in a courtroom and not be the defendant. You know? <laughs> um, and I would say that to the judge's comment about this session about aging with dignity. I'm gonna start with an audience question. How many people in this room are baby boomers? Raise your hand. And how many of you are in denial about aging? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, we're gonna have, have a good session here. All right, so let's get started. Um, let's begin, since I'm from Washington, D.C., and don't hold that against me, uh, it's where I have my business and my work. Um, we are going through a unique period in time in American history. And I will be as bipartisan as one can be, uh, and if I'm not, I'm sure somebody will tell me uh, during the Q&As. But we're talking about understanding recent federal changes on aging and healthcare policy, which right now is as relevant as anything that's going on in Washington right now. I say to people, it is, there is never a dull moment since Donald Trump became President of the United States, okay, in Washington. We're on day number 467 of this administration. Words like unusual, unprecedented, unpredictable come to mind. Um, but, you know, the reason that slide has what it says is because we do a lot of work in advocacy, as you will be doing your work later in life. And we tell people two things. You don't panic when you hear something, and you never get complacent at any juncture in the process. And some of the things that provoked panic over the past couple of years were contained in the President, bud the President Trump's first budgets that were sent to Congress. And I'm one, st I'm one slide ahead of myself, okay. So in the president's first budget, he called for the whole scale elimination, not just cuts, but elimination of key programs. And you'll see them on the next chart uh, what they were, but I'll give it to them, such as programs like Legal Services Corporation, programs like the Social Services Block Grant, the Community Services Block Grant, the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities. Um, and people saw these things and they got panicky. 
they immediately got nervous and said, my God, my program's gone. I have no money left. My, it's out the window. But you know what? You got to go back and look at history. President Obama sent eight budgets to the Congress. Not a single one was ever approved. President Bush II sent eight budgets to the Congress, and not a single one was ever approved. They're never, as, they're never uh, accepted the way they're submitted. And it's no different with President Trump. And in fact, as you'll see in a chart, Congress went ahead and did a whole different direction on budgets this year. And if I say to you a bipartisan agreement, you would say, that can't be Washington. A bipartisan agreement was reached? Yes, it was. And dealing with funding levels. But before I get to that, I want to tell a story that may, may help put this in context. So when the president's budget first came out, they had a press briefing in the White House, and the president's budget director was asked by a reporter from ABC, why are you picking on Meals on Wheels? How many people who know about Meals on Wheels, right? OK, universal name, whatever. And one of the pre president's proposals was to get rid of the Community Development Block Grant, which included money for Meals on Wheels. And the budget director said, well, because they really don't show any results. And that's why we picked them on. And we went, really? And I run an advocacy group called the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Service Programs. There's also a group called Meals on Wheels America. Within the hour, phones were ringing like crazy. And guess who was calling on the phone? Members of Congress saying, tell me where the closest nutrition program is that I can go see. So I can go see for myself whether or not they have results or don't have results. Okay? And that was probably a godsend from an advocacy standpoint. When you get a situation like that and you have a chance to, to show the alternative, it turns out really well. And as a result of that, in this budget agreement that I'll talk about in a minute, nutrition programs got a $59 million increase just for this fiscal year that ends on September 30th. A $59 million increase for Meals on Wheels and current Good Meals. So advocacy versus panic. Another good example, and I talked to some folks involved in the SHIP program. What's it called down here, the SHINE program? The Health Insurance Counseling Program? It was proposed to be eliminated in the President's budget. And you know, it provides important Medicare counseling to older adults. Healthcare counseling is very important right now. And you know, it's crucial with, a bunch, with all the choices that are out there and the difficulty using Plan Finder. This program funding was restored and it got a $2 million increase in the budget agreement just passed by Congress. So here's, what, here's the, the, one of the bottom lines. If you don't panic and you replace panic with advocacy, you can get good results. And I want to keep that lesson going forward as we talk about things today. So here, take a minute and look at these, at these numbers, OK? The middle column is probably the most important, because that represents what current funding will be from now through September 30th for a, a variety of aging programs, OK? So you can see that many of them were given actual increases from where we started in the beginning of the year. Look where, for example, where the zeros are. Okay, those zeros existed in the president's first budget in FY18 and also in FY19. So everything was restored, including some programs that got significant increases. Take one example, the Low Income Energy Assistance Program. Okay, you don't have a problem down here with heating homes too much, but you do have issues with cooling homes, right? People with low income assistance, they, there's a program, a federal program that's been available for, for years. It was proposed to be eliminated in the president's budget. Congress not only put the money back, they increased it by $250 million. So the point about all this is that everything you can see on this chart, I can point to an advocate that helped make those numbers happen. And it's always about being able to deliver the message effectively on a bipartisan basis to the Congress of the United States about the value of a program. And I'll give you one, my favorite example probably does deal with the nutrition programs for older adults. The average age of a person who goes to a congregate nutrition program in this country is now 78. The average age of a person getting a home-delivered meal is now 81. The Older Americans Act, which funds those programs, has eligibility at 60. And many people who went into those programs were assessed by social workers, or assessed by aging staff people, as being in need of nutrition. Otherwise, they would have to get it in a hospital or a nursing home. You compare the price of a home-delivered meal versus a day in a hospital or a day in a nursing home, and your case is made. 
You could put, for one day in a hospital, you can provide one year of home-delivered meals. Okay? So the point here is that you are demonstrating the way you should demonstrate, that there's a value proposition associated with these programs for older adults. Because it's about aging with dignity, aging with independence. This, this you go down about five to the Title V, the CSEP program. Anybody know the CSEP program? Anybody familiar with that? This is a wonderful federal program that provides low-income adults, 55 and over, with part-time community service jobs. Okay? And where do they work? In libraries, in hospitals, in senior centers. Okay? Giving back, but also having an opportunity to get a job. You take the uh, Elder Justice Initiative, okay? and we're going to talk more about Elder Justice later. This is elder abuse prevention. Okay? Talking about a growing problem in this country that got an, a small increase in there. And then the last one I'll talk about in the nutrition space is the Senior Farmers Market Program. Anybody familiar with that program? Okay, good for you. Great program, right? This is, one, this is a federal program that does something that very few federal programs do. It provides a win-win, okay? The two winners in this program, low-income older adults get access to fresh fruits and vegetables, and the small farmer gets access to a new market to sell their products, okay? Both constituencies are important in this day and age, and this program is the one that takes care of them. So this chart tells you the status of things in Washington right now. And those numbers, I could not have dreamed we would be talking about these numbers at the beginning of this year. But when you are given a challenge, such as an elimination of a program, and you know how to do advocacy, these are the results. So keep that in mind for those of you who do any kind of advocacy work. If you know about messaging, if you know about constituent work, if you know about grassroots, if you know how to tell a story, okay? Nobody needs to read a book or write a book about a program. If you can bring one good story in about a successful person who benefited from a program, you will deliver a very important message to, to elected officials. Now, in the next category of also don't panic, the Affordable Care Act, okay? Now, ACA, you think, stands for the Affordable Care Act, right? It doesn't. It stands for the American Conversation Act. <laughs> Eight years since this law was signed by the President Obama. And it's still talked about either you love it, you hate it. There's very few apathetic people with respect to the Affordable Care Act. And as you remember, you know, the goal was to repeal, replace, redo, redesign, whatever the term was, the Affordable Care Act. It was a fundamental goal of the President and the majority in the House and the Senate. The ACA was the law of the land when we started in 2017. The ACA, with the, with the important exception of the elimination of the individual mandate to get insurance, the ACA is still the law of the land. But the most important thing that has been preserved from the Affordable Care Act is what it has done for the Medicare program. And one of the things that Tracy said, you know, talk about, you know, what are, what are federal programs doing to help people remain in their communities? Well, you know, right here and there, if you look at this list of expanded preventative benefits with no co-pays that were established through the Affordable Care Act, there's your answer. You know, cardiovascular disease screenings, diabetes screenings, the welcome to Medicare, great concept, right? But you know what an interesting story about that? The take-up rate is much lower than people thought it would be. People thought older people, when they turned 65 and got into the Medicare program, would, would run to take that welcome to Medicare uh, visit or exam. It's not happening. It's got to be promoted more than it, than it currently has been. But you have annual wellness visits, too, that are under Medicare, that are important for understanding you know, how to keep yourself healthy, and mammograms and so on, and vaccinations. You know, and you know, we spend a lot of time in my, in my business life talking about the need for older adults to get more vaccinations, particularly the pneumonia vaccine. You know, pneumonia is a scary thing for an older person to get. And there was a period of time about two years ago when, you know, and Medicare was sort of broken down into two areas. People who were on Medicare for a long time had access to a pneumonia vaccine that was covered under Medicare. But in the years since that time, the quality of the pneumonia vaccine got a lot better. So the newer people in Medicare could get the newer pneumonia vaccine and get covered under Medicare, but the older people who went back to try to get a second vaccine were told no, okay? So we went to work 
on the administration at the time, under the Obama administration, said it should be available for everybody. And nothing in Washington happens overnight, right? I mean, it's a long, slow process. And I remember this. I went down and testified before a group called the Advisory Council um, ACIP. I can't remember what it stands for now, but it's an advisory group to the Centers for Disease Control. And we made a case to say you should make this eligible under Medicare. I made that case in October of 2014. We did a bunch of advocacy on New Year's Eve in 2015. They approved it. They made it cover, not only made it cover, eligible under Medicare coverage, but made it retroactive for six months. So now we have seen a take up rate increase by older adults taking this new and better vaccine for pneumonia. So why now? Why are we seeing this expansion in preventative benefits under Medicare? I believe a good part of it has to do with the fact that boomers became eligible for Medicare. The boomers want things differently. We're such a demanding group, aren't we? You know, I'm a boomer, right? We're such a demanding group. You know, we don't like the way things are. We, go, we, we push and we push and we make things change happen. Well, you know what boomers would say? And, I've, and I sat through enough congressional hearings and enough things in my life that I've heard conversations with boomers. They would say, you know, the, the old Medicare program was a great program for people who got sick. Okay, once you got into a hospital or in a situation, it was great coverage, right? But it did very little to keep you from getting sick. That's not the Medicare we want. We want a Medicare that's going to step up early and focus on prevention. And guess what? Look at that last number. There are more preventative benefits since boomers started turning 65 than in the previous 46 years of Medicare's history. So if you have any doubt about how boomers can impact policy, there's one of those best examples you could find. And you know, the Affordable Care Act has helped considerably to strengthen Medicare. Here are some of the other things that they're working on to improve Medicare. Now, you've got to remember that Medicare you know, was on the edge of going into uh, default, the hospital program under Medicare, as early as 2019. Now, you Orange County TV guys, I'm moving just a minute here, all right? Is that cool? Can I go get my water without disrupting the flow of <laughs> TV here? Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, but the way that Medicare has gotten strengthened through the Affordable Care Act has been through doing some fundamental delivery system reforms, okay? Things like paying for value and not volume, okay? How many people have been through an experience, either with a relative or someone you know, and they come back from a hospital stay, and they're eligible for Medicare, and there's a bunch of tests on that bill? And they don't remember all those tests, necessarily. But guess what? Medicare would pay for pretty much all those tests in the old days. Now, there has to be a proven relationship between what you are got, getting and the outcome in terms of you coming out of the hospital or being healthier or whatever it may be, reducing the amount of um, coverage that Medicare would provide for so that you get people out of the hospital faster. But the second part of that deal, anybody heard of the care transition programs at all in this area? You know about those? Okay. What's the concept behind care transition? Lowering hospital readmissions. We had this big problem with Medicare, big problem about people going back into hospitals 30 days after they were discharged. In many cases, because they were discharged back to a community that did not have services that might keep them healthy, such as meals, such as transportation. So they created this care transition program, set it up in a number of parts of the country, incorporated the folks in the aging network, like area agencies on aging and senior centers and nutrition programs, and said, let's work together with the goal of lowering hospital readmissions. It was called the Community Care Transitions Program. And here's an important trend that I hope will continue as we go forward. It is about strengthening the local service providers' situation. If you are providing the service closest to the person, Okay, and you're having person-centered care as part of the deal, then you're doing the right thing for a lot of reasons, including the, the, the individual themselves. But you're also helping Medicare stay stronger. Because Medicare was being drained by hospital readmissions. Now, the only problem so far is that the previous administration gave up on the care transition program before they should. And it was never really clear to me, but I can give two reasons that I think may have some bearing. When the Affordable Care Act passed, you know, there was a lot of controversy, right, with the Affordable Care Act? Everybody remembers that? 
Hard to forget that, right? I mean, the only law I can remember in the 40 years I worked in Washington that passed without a single vote from the Republican side. The minority party gave not one vote in favor of the Affordable Care Act. I've never seen that in my working life, which makes it a target automatically. But what also happened was, in an effort to show results from the Affordable Care Act, the Obama administration sent money out into the street way too quick. Didn't think it out, didn't test things properly, you know, and this was one of the best examples, these care transition things. So they sent these money out. There were people ready to take the money. There were people on the ground ready to do the right thing, but they had no metrics to be measured by. No, you know, they didn't understand how to measure how you, whether you can define success or not. And all of a sudden they just said, well, you know, we thank you all that did the program, but we're going to move on. So now there's a whole new effort that this administration has happily opened the door for. And again, I'm, uh, what I want to avoid doing, see, I, I, here's what I'm going to avoid doing. I'm from Washington, right? Acronyms are, we live by acronyms. Everything's got an acronym to it, right? Well, I'm the son of an anesthesiologist. You know what they do for a living? Put people to sleep, right? <laughs> I vowed to my late father that I would never emulate him at a podium, okay? <laughs> so too many statistics and too many acronyms will do that, okay? But I'll give you one acronym that's important for this piece of the presentation. CMMI, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, or its short name is the Innovation Center. Now, to show you how things change in Washington, and these days they change every day. I, I, I should have read my phone before I got up here to, to see if anything, I missed anything on, on the way in. A year ago, the Republicans, this was a $10 billion investment in innovation for the future. Okay? How to deliver health care, how to do a better job of this and that and this and that. So some folks in Congress said, this is a boondoggle. You know, we shouldn't be spending this kind of money. We could put that money somewhere else. So they're having hearings to get rid of the CMMI altogether, which funded the care transitions program. Well, then the president gets elected, and the first thing they send out is called an RFI. Okay, some of you know RFPs. And R, you know, RFI is a request for information. And you know what the request for information was? How can we make the CMMI run better? So six months ago, they're going to get rid of it. Now they want to see how to make it better. And guess what? Tons of advocates are answering that RFI. And I, together with a bunch of people, said, bring the care transitions program back, strengthen it, and we'll do a better job for older people in the Medicare program. So let's see what happens. Other Medicare changes that happen? Don't you love, I have this wonderful 30-something um, senior associate in my office, Georgetown Law graduate, smart as heck, but does great artwork on slides, doesn't she? <laughs> do you think I could even do this stuff? No, you know. She's, she's terrified uh, to see if I try to put artwork in a project. But what else happened in that budget agreement that I showed you that had all those increases in it? It did a couple of things in Medicare, too. Anybody know what the donut hole is? Anybody heard what the donut hole is? Yeah. Yay, all right. So the donut hole, which is what people fall into if their drug bills fall between a certain amount, and the Medicare Part D program doesn't give you any coverage. See, Medicare Part D, the prescription drug benefit, does well if you have drug bills up to about $2,000, and if you have drug bills over $4,500, it's really good. It's like pays for 95% of it. But if you're in that donut hole, it does nothing. The Affordable Care Act said, let's get rid of that donut hole by the year 2020. This budget agreement on a bipartisan basis, and every time I talk about this budget agreement, it's a bipartisan budget agreement. They said, let's move it up a year. Let's close the donut hole by 2019, next year. And you know how they're going to do that? They're going to have the drug companies pay more of the costs associated with closing the donut hole than they ever did before. Hard to believe. The vaunted drug industry that everybody says does so well in Washington just got clobbered in this bill, big time. And there's no turning back because you're not going to change that law. Meantime, older adults will never be in a donut hole after 2019. You can clap for that one. Come on, that's good. <laughs> and then the proper use of medication can keep older adults at home and more independent. That's certainly part of what Tracy wanted, the Medicare and keeping people in their community. Now, this to also show you that you could be from Washington and have a slideshow written three or four days ago, and parts of it are obsolete three or four days later. And we talked about it upstairs at lunch, and I actually have to find this in my folder, because this happened last night. Yes, it is exciting that they have the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, 
Okay, you gotta remember that one. They're the most important game in town right now if you deal with healthcare and older adults. They said, they put a little teaser out into the street and they said, you know what? We're gonna start allowing Medicare Advantage, okay, which is the new alternative to fee-for-service Medicare that a lot of people are signing up for because of all these new benefits that are available under Medicare Advantage. They said, we're gonna even go farther than that. We're gonna talk about adding some supplemental benefits um, to Medicare Advantage. Automatically, the first thing that came to my mind and some other advocates' mind was nutrition. Medicare coverage for home delivered meals for people coming out of hospitals. Good idea. Long overdue, right? Shouldn't we be doing stuff like that going forward? Well, yesterday they came out. Now, the argument that was used how many people have heard the term social determinant of health? Okay, has that made the world, has that made it all the way down here like it does in Washington? And, and like, how about evidence based? Evidence based, a big word up? Oh, yeah, okay, good. No, you know. So when we were writing our advocacy letter urging them to include nutrition in the supplemental benefit, we obviously said it's one of the key social determinants of health. I'm going to read you what came out last night from the Better Medicare Alliance, which is the group representing uh, Medicare Advantage. On Friday, the Centers for Medicaid and Services released additional guidance. That should scare you right away. When CMS issues guidance, it probably means you're more confused after the guidance than you were before. Right? on how to cover supplemental benefits. Quote, services primarily used for cosmetic, comfort, general use, or to address social determinants of health are not allowable supplemental benefits under this new definition. And as we said upstairs, I think it was Ann that said upstairs, first climate change, okay, now social determinants of health are banned words now in the, uh, in the, in the jargon of Washington. I will say this much. From an advocacy standpoint, we're not going to let that one go, okay? Because nutrition should be covered under Medicare Advantage and under Medicare. And so, anybody wants to join that fight, you have my email. We'll take your, we'll take your leadership wonderfully, okay? Now, Medicaid and home, home and community-based services. And Ann's going to talk a lot about Medicaid, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. But I think there's something we all have to think about. And this is actually an advocacy victory. Because, you know, for a long time, people kept saying, yes, Medicaid is the largest payer of long-term care in the country. But most of that money was going for institutional care. Okay? You know, the, the home and community-based system was not that robust 10, 15 years ago. Okay? But as time went on and more options became available and more older adults and their families prefer home and community-based services over institutional care, now for the first time in history, since 2013, Medicaid is now spending more on home and community-based care than it did on institutional care. That is a big breakthrough for the Medicaid program. But also remember one other thing, too. Medicaid is now bigger than Medicare. Okay? Nobody thought that was going to happen anytime soon. It's now bigger than Medicare. But there are, and these are, this is just an example of the states that are participating in mul you know, multiple Medicaid home and community-based service options provided or enhanced by the Affordable Care Act. So you have some states with three options and four options in Florida with one. And of course, those states that have none, shame on them. But, you know. um, but these are all indications of where we are moving in the Medicaid space. However, you know, we can never stop being advocates. You may think something has passed as a challenge or a crisis, but it may not have really. Okay? So did, we, did the Affordable Care Act get repealed? No, not entirely. But did we lose the big threat to Medicare? Not entirely. There are still people in Washington who say we should replace the Medicare system with a private voucher system. Louder, please. Uh, okay? And there's people who believe that. They really do believe that they should go that route. Well, and, and there was some standing on that. Well, you know what? Somebody announced their retirement the other day, didn't they? Announced they're not running for re-election the other day? The beleaguered Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. Poor Paul Ryan, you know. He needs to spend more time with his family. His kids are like, no, Dad, stay in Washington, please. You know? um, a guy who fires the chaplain. Hello. You hear that story? This, this is a great story. All right. Now, I'm a Catholic, and I went to a Jesu Jesuit university. They're like night and day, okay? The chaplain is a Jesuit. 
the speaker was a, a Catholic. The chaplain gave a prayer right before the act vote on the uh, tax bill and made some comments that could have been construed as partially political. Okay, basically talked about, you know, let's hope this tax bill is fair for everybody that we all see the benefits, you know, this and that, this and that. Well, that apparently enraged the speaker. And then he decided that the real reason that he wants to get rid of him is not providing enough pastoral counseling, you know, from people in the house. Well, you know, nothing in Washington goes without a controversy. So all the Jesuit lovers in the Congress have been writing letters to the speaker going, you can't fire this chaplain. Well, let's just say he is, he's leaving Congress for a reason because he can't tire of all the grief he gets. However, his leaving, his, Speaker Ryan leaving and not running for election takes away the biggest supporter of Medicare premium support. And the question becomes, is anybody else going to pick it up? But guess what? If you read anything today in these political publications that come out, he says, I think I have President Trump convinced to start making changes to entitlement programs like Medicare. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. And before I forget, should you ever be in this situation where you are out defending the program called Social Security? Okay, how many people like the Social Security program? Raise your hand. Okay, how many people understand its value and its importance, right? How many people think it's an entitlement program? Raise your hand. Okay. Join me in this terminology. Anytime someone says to you, we need to cut Social Security because it's an entitlement program, you say it's an earned benefit program. It's an earned benefit program. So keep that in mind when you start going after people who want to take fundamental changes to the redirection of a Social Security program. Medicaid, and again, my colleague will be covering this in greater detail as it relates to Florida, but you know, there's big threats to Medicaid. There's a lot of people who just don't like the Medicaid. There's two programs that are really disliked in Washington, and both of which you probably know about. The Medicaid program and the food stamp program or the SNAP program, as it's called. There are fundamental differences of opinion. They run deep, wide, and, and strong, okay? And, you know, and everybody fights hard for those programs. But what this administration is smart at doing, okay, very smart at doing, is understand they have powers of their own to change the direction of a Medicaid program by approving waivers from states to impose work requirements for the first time on people. <laughs> You know, I'm from, I'm from Virginia, um, even though I have a New York accent that's left over from 40 years ago. Which, that's another story. I was the ARP volunteer president for three years in Virginia, and we were trying to get Medicaid expansion done the whole time I was state president. And we discovered that if we expanded Medicaid in Virginia, 400,000 low-income uh, Virginians would get coverage. We also discovered that 83% of them already worked, okay? So this is a working poor help program. The notion of imposing work requirements as if nobody's working in the Medicaid program is not exactly honest. However, a state gets a waiver approved and they can try this, try that, try this, try that. They're all designed to achieve reforms under Medicaid state by state by state. Lifetime limits on coverage, you know, you just, at a certain point, you can't be eligible for Medicaid any further. These are being proposed by states and being approved in some cases by Washington. But the thing we were talking about upstairs and, and the one that worries everybody the most is do you change the whole structure of Medicaid by making either a block grant where the states are controlling everything or you put a per capita limit on how much you can spend on any person in the Medicaid program. Let me tell you, my, my theory about block grants is very simple. Sometimes Washington can give up too much control. Block grant's the best example. I'll give you one in particular. A program called the Social Services Block Grant. Some of you may know about this program. It is the only funding source for adult protective services in this country. But because the states can, can control that money is spent, there are 13 states in this country who do not spend a nickel on adult protective services under the Social Service Block Grant because they don't have to. You cannot have Medicaid become a block grant program just for that reason alone. You cannot give up that much control at the federal level. But it's on people's minds and will be discussed about. So let's go to the Older Americans Act, which is a lovely, wonderful program that 
is about 55 years old in 2020. It's up for renewal next year. And, you know, it's worth going back a little to the original statement that was made in 1965 when this law was passed. And if this slide is readable, I'll be very happy. The next one. These were considered the original objectives of the Older Americans Act. I mean, this is, you, those of you who study aging policy, if you're looking for a comprehensive statement of national aging policy, what it should be, there it is. Okay, not that you can see it, unfortunately, but, um, but trust me, when you get the slides, if you ask me for them, you can read it loud and clear. But I'll give you just two or three of them. An adequate income in retirement in accordance with the American standard of living. The best possible physical and mental health which science can make available and without regard to economic status. Pursuit of meaningful activity within the widest range of civic, cultural, and recreational opportunities. 1965, this was written, right? Immediate benefit from proven research knowledge which can sustain, which can sustain and improve health and happiness. Okay? If we had just adopted two or three of these over the course of time, we would have a different direction as a nation on how we're doing aging policy. So yes, for this one reason alone, Ask for, ask for the slides so you can see these wonderful objectives that were done. But the Older American Act over its history has added strong community-based services in nutrition, supportive services, family caregiver, disease prevention, and health promotion, all things that keep older adults happy and in their community. The Title V, I mentioned that program before, the low-income older adult remains in the community and at home because they have a job in the community. Title VI deals with Native American older adults. And believe me, though, that, is a, that is a situation that needs a lot more attention. The condition of older adults on Indian reservations across the country. Um, you know, there's, there's years and years and years of neglect. That, and this one program is trying to address some of it. And then Title VII is the section on elder abuse in the, in the uh, Older Americans Act that provides funding for community-based elder, uh, elder abuse prevention and so on. All right, let's take a moment give ourselves a round of applause. This is Older Americans Month, the month of May. Let's hear it for Older Americans Month. Okay, any older American that you know, say happy Older Americans Month to them later. <laughs> and this is, you know, Older Americans Act. The theme of Older Americans Month is engage at every age. Okay? That sounds to me like you're, you're fostering polygamy, um, but you're really not. Um, I'm sure that wasn't their intent. Uh, but one, one could see that. Um, but let's talk about the future of the Old Americans Act, because, you know, we do have to think about the future of all these federal programs. You don't want to see, you know, the Old Americans Act is almost, you know, is over 50 years old. Anybody drive a 50-year-old car anymore? Right? Judge, you do? Good. For, judge, I'm, I, you know. <laughs> you got to make changes. You got to get a new vehicle. You got to do, do the same thing with federal laws. Okay? The biggest thing, and this, and this is very relevant in Florida, is the inter, impact of managed, managed care entering communities across the country. The aging network, your area agents on aging, your nutrition providers, everybody needs to understand that they are also in a business. You may be providing social and human services, but it's a business. When managed care comes in, it's a business. They want to know what something costs. How do you price something? How do you price the meal? How do you price transportation? How do you do this? And the reason why the aging network has to learn how to do this, that's a new funding source for them, the managed care world, okay? It's a, it's a new and additional funding source. But right now, these communities don't talk to each other as much as they should. We also have mandatory enrollment in the Medicaid Managed Long-Term Care Services and Supports Program. But we're also talking about the need to have more focus on integrated care, care coordination between the healthcare providers and community-based organizations. That is really at the heart of what the future of programs like the Older Americans Act have to be. And I call down to the four F's, if you will, okay? Obviously, more funding is needed for the Older Americans Act. It has been underfunded for 20 years or more. But you know what? It's called discretionary funding. It's at the discretion of Congress if you give a certain amount of money. Maybe it's time to have the Older Americans Act have mandatory funding. And even, and this would be rocket, this is not rocket science. We know for a fact but we don't have the data to prove it, that the Old Americans Act, every day it operates, saves Medicaid and Medicare, Medicare a lot of money. 
If we could find a way to get those calculations done, that could be a new funding source for the Old Americans Act. If you achieved X amount of savings, if you even gave 20% of those savings to strengthen the Old Americans Act, that would be a much better outcome for those programs. Flexibility. You know, this program does drive itself at the local level, but we need more local decision making about the kinds of services that are offered. The senior center of yesterday is not going to work for an older adult 60 years of age now. They don't want the same programs as before. I spend a lot of time in nutrition programs. I look at what is served in, the meal, in those programs. The programs that are doing the best have the cafe options, have the wider choices, have different arrangements of, of food, have culturally sensitive and competent uh, choices. It doesn't necessarily cost more money because you can make it up by increased demand. But we need to have more flexibility at the local level. And then, of course, we need a stronger evidence base that's done through local experience. With all due respect to academics, I don't want to read another journal about evidence based this or that. You know, show me some results that occur at the local level that you can measure day to day. The, the third F is foresight. We need to modernize the programs, like I just have senior centers, the nutrition program, to make the family caregiver program more responsive. You know, you know how, many, how many millions of families in this country have family caregiving responsibility? Over 43 million. Guess what, how many federal programs there are dedicated to family caregivers? One. The National Family Caregiver Support Program, which has $150 million for the whole country. Hello? Do you think it's time we did a little change on that? A little time to build that up a little bit, make it a little stronger? Okay, that's certainly what we have to do going forward. And the last point here about bringing back demonstrations. Now, that doesn't mean going out into the street and, you know, having protests. I'm talking about demonstrations that tested out new models. You know the Meals on Wheels program? It was a demonstration program in the 70s. Okay? Seven states, they tried it out, they said, yes, look at this, it really works well. It became a national program. But you've got to test these things and demonstrations of how you do it. And then finally, funding, fostering advocacy. The Older Americans Act allows advocacy. It's written in the law. Okay? But not enough people know about it or do anything about it. It should be the central advocacy voice for older adults in Washington. So we, we look forward next year to seeing what we can do to make the Older Americans Act stronger. And the last couple of times we've been kind of timid, maybe time to get bold. All right, now, future of aging policy on a personal level. Yes, May 2nd is a special day because I got to be invited to come here, which is lovely. And I'm very appreciative of it, and I can't wait to hear what your questions will be when we get to that point. But it's also the 23rd anniversary of something I was very involved in that was mentioned in the introduction. The convening of the 1995 White House Conference on Aging happened on May 2nd of 1995. And I got to be at the, um, this is, you want to hear a good story? All right. <laughs> now, at, where, where's, uh, where's Mimi? Mimi's here. Mimi, you'll love this story. I gave her two stories already, but she, this one I didn't give her. So, when you are the executive director of the White House Conference on Aging, you're appointed by the president. The day of the opening session, the president comes to speak, the vice president comes to speak, four or five senators come to speak, you know, a bunch of like highbrow people show up, right? So, but technically, on a protocol basis, I open the White House Conference on Aging. So, out in front of me are 3,000 people in a ballroom in Washington. There are 20,000 people on satellite hookups all over the country, right? Because Bill Clinton wanted a teleprompter, all the stuff had to be shoved into a teleprompter. So, you know, I go to the teleprompter, I get ready, I'm supposed to do a three minute, you know, welcome and everything else. I look in the teleprompter, and what does it say? Remarks of the President William Jefferson Clinton. They forgot to put my remarks in the teleprompter. So I took a deep breath, and I said, if I can't do a three-minute uh, welcome after having this job for a year and a half, I don't belong up here. So I took the deep breath, I finished it. My parents were in the audience. All the mothers will love this story, right? My father comes up and says, Bobby, you were great. My mother says, Something was wrong up there. What was that about? <laughs> Something was wrong up there. I could tell. <laughs> so 23 years ago, I was sweating bullets, standing on the stage, but we, we had our White House come. And you know what? What was our main recommendation? The American community, a vision for the future. Our principles in 1995, and tell me how many of these are still relevant today. I think all of them are. To value independence of people on an intergenerational basis, promoting personal security, Encouraging personal responsibility, recognizing interdependence of the generations, okay, which is, you know, still a very important thing. The safety net to support vulnerable populations, 
recognizing and responding to America's growing diversity, which has grown considerably more so since 1995, and ensure the quality of life of all Americans as they age. And then we apply these principles to three areas, economic security, health, and well-being. This is 1995, okay? And I think the mission, you know, is of, the, of the Old Americans Act is as relevant today as it was in 1965, and our principles are as relevant as they were in 1995. It's about maintaining the independence and dignity of older adults in the community through consumer-driven home and community-based services, targeting those in the greatest economic or social need, and leverage other supports for services. Tracy, how am I doing? How many minutes? I can do it. I can do it. <laughs> All right. Going forward in the future, if you're in the field of aging and aging services, it's about documenting and demonstrating your value. Okay? Focusing on outcomes. Focusing on intervention of services that are preferred by older adults and their families and how it saves money. It's about data, but we have to collect the right data. Okay? And we must show the evidence base. The future of managed care. Managed care and the aging network should not be working in silos anymore. They need to come together and learn how to communicate with one another, okay, and the network to be more business ready going forward. We should know how to price, serv uh, price services and, price the and, and understand the value. And our services, they've evolved over the course of time to meet changing needs, but we have to continue it. We have to work on program design, service delivery, where are services located? They need to be where the people are, right? Don't be putting things where people aren't and then wonder why they don't come. How you choose your staff becomes very important in the future if you run a nonprofit in any service area, but more importantly, how you choose your board. Guess what? I serve on a lot of boards, national and local boards. We're critical to the future of nonprofit groups because we're the ones that are willing to take the risk and step out and do the right thing. On diversity, the changing face of the older population is so obvious. The minority aging population will double, double by 2030. Okay, we need to have better targeting to reach those people going forward. And we must recognize the growing community of LGBT older adults that need culturally competent services as well. And you know what? If you're smart, you don't look at the diverse issue as a demographic challenge, but a market opportunity. Okay? You could do really well if you know how to cater to the diverse aging population in this country. Future of family caregivers, we've got to be more sensitive and recognize the importance of family caregivers. And we ought to be focusing on education and training. And we also need a greater focus on grandparents raising grandchildren, of which there are now 4 million in this country. Age-friendly communities, you know, there's some down here. We know we need to be focusing on that. Um, but it's about coordination of services, about community. And the rest of this, I don't have time to read. So let me get to the end here, because I want to close with, with a, a, a more a personal type of thought. You know, I worked for Claude Pepper, who, may, who remember, anybody remember Claude Pepper beside me? All right, yay. <laughs> you know what, this man was so foresighted, it was unbelievable, okay? He was the one who said, we need a long-term care policy in this country, All right? And now, long-term care is the greatest unfunded liability in the boomer generation. And what do we have to show for it? Nothing, right? And so, there are conclusions to this speech. Imagine that, okay? It can be done on the same day that it begins, right? Within the reality of our aging population, we need to focus on the 85 and over population that's growing the fastest and the aging of boomers. We must address long-term care. We must focus more attention on home and community-based services. We should address Social Security before it becomes a crisis, okay? Before it becomes a crisis. We must tackle the growing menace of elder abuse. I could do a whole speech on that. The importance of housing and transportation to the older adult quality of life. The two overlooked things in our nation right now are housing and transportation for older adults. We must invest in nutrition because it's important to good health. You'll see a handout, I hope you, got it, you picked it up, the multicolored one on malnutrition and older adults, please read that. We must make cultural competency a working goal. And as I sit in this room of young people, we need more young people in the field of aging. Okay, we've got to make the field attractive, but we need you in that field. We need to value social workers more and welcome their expertise more into the field of aging. We must collectively work on an intergenerational basis promoting community, and we must deeply address the one ism that we're all going to face, ageism. We can all be a victim of racism, we can all be a victim of sexism, we can all be victims of ageism. And the key to all this is advocacy. 
And with that, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome to the podium my colleague, Ann. Okay, thank you all very much, and we'll catch up later. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's humbling to follow Bob. He has just an incredible wealth of experience. But um, my key takeaway from your presentation, Bob, was this replace panic with advocacy. I think we need to put that in a bumper sticker. Um, and it, you had a very uplifting, optimistic message, which is good. We need to hear that these days. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about where I work. Um, I work at the Florida Policy Institute. We're a, a very new nonprofit. Um, we are independent, nonpartisan, and our overall mission is to um, promote widespread prosperity for all Floridians, and that includes the most vulnerable Floridians in our communities. Um, and what we try to do is, um, whoops, let's see if I can go the right way, um, is to translate public policy proposals, policy decisions, into something that non-wonky audiences can appreciate, can um, have the desire to engage in, and feel like this really matters to all of us, um, our communities, our families, our neighbors. And um, these, this slide shows the core areas that the Policy Institute focuses on. Our real bread and butter is around state budget and tax issues don't glaze over, and of course, that has implications for all these other areas, jobs and income, health care, and education. And so we also um, do work on those issues as well. And I was brought into the Policy Institute in 2017 to focus on health work. Um, my background for most of my career, I was a legal services attorney um, representing indigent clients. And so that really brought me to the world of policy and an appreciation on how this impacts people's everyday lives on the ground. So um, I'll get this I'll get this down soon. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, so really to have a policy discussion uh, and specifically turning to Florida we need to appreciate and understand the demographics. Um, so that's going to be the first thing we talk about. And then I'm going to talk about some of the budget decisions that were made just this past 2018 legislative um, session. Um, then we're going to talk about just a, a highlights of some of the substantive legislation that was passed relating to aging and health policy. And then some threats that are on the horizon that we need to keep our eyes on as we try to put more investment in health and human services in the state, which are desperately needed. So demographics, um, these are critical to what needs to be driving policy and policy decisions in this state and needs to be kept on the forefront of our minds and our policy leaders. Um, we have, and I'll start with the um, people with disabilities and, and elderly, um, we are SSI population, and that, that's low-income people with severe disabilities. That population is growing at tw over twice the rate of the national rate. Um, and of course, um, these are often people who need a lot of services. Um, similarly, our elderly population is growing at an incredibly fast rate. I think Bob mentioned the 85 plus, 85 years and older plus segment is the fastest growing population. Um, I saw recently a Department of Elder Affairs statistic that we have over half a million people 65 and older with Alzheimer's in Florida, and that number is just going to keep growing. Um, poverty. Uh, Florida has um, more than the national rate in terms of poverty. We have over 3 million people in poverty. And then another group 
this includes, and we refer to them as the working poor, although I have to say a lot of people in poverty are working, and so, but there are people living over the poverty line um, who can't meet the, the basic needs of their families. They are struggling to pay for food and housing. And the United Way does a study um, called the ALICE study. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but it, it's a weird acronym, Asset Limited, Income Constrained, and Employed. But these are, um, includes working families. And to me, this is an incredibly staggering statistic that 44% of Florida's 7.5 million households um, struggle to meet basic necessities. Um, that, that's a sobering statistic. Um, one of the things the Policy Institute does is we compile a report card. Um, we look at a variety of indicators um, and where Florida um, ranks in different national rankings on these indicators. And um, as you can see, we have the notorious honor of being dead last or clearly in the bottom on um, a number of indicators. I mean, shockingly, mental health services, investment in public services, um, affordable housing, retaining teachers, rate of insured residents, and long-term care services and supports. And we'll be talking more about that indicator. So, this is where we are today. I mean, this is where, <laughs> when we talk about going forward, these rankings are, very, are really abysmal. And you could argue that they reflect the intersection of our demographics and the public policy decisions that have been made to date. Um, and as we talk more about what just happened during session, we need to keep these in mind. So the budget. and. Um, I'll try not to overwhelm people with the facts and the, the numbers, which can cause one to glaze over. But um, why are we looking at the budget? Um, the, um, the only bill that the legislature has to pass is the General Appropriations Act every year. Um, and so, and there are hundreds of substantive legislative bills that are filed every year, but most of them just die. And so um, the General Appropriations Act is the financial plan for the state. It determines the total amount of state funds that are going to be spent and over the next fiscal year, which in Florida runs from um, uh, June, July 1st through June 30th. Um, and so the Appropriations Act gives the total amount of funds, and also allocates it to specific agencies and programs. Um, because most of the um, bills, substantive bills, die during session, the budget process and the budget legislation really becomes the epicenter for major policy decisions that are being made. So the, so the money really is driving the policy in the state. Um, one, if you want to dive deeper into the Florida budget, the Policy Institute puts out a Citizen's Guide to the Budget, which is a very accessible um, document um, explaining the process and how citizens can get involved in influencing that process. So the budget that we just passed, it's a total of $88.7 billion, which is a big chunk of money. Um, you can see that the, the largest investments are in, in education and human services. Um, and, but you should know that a, a substantial amount of those funds are federal funds, and specifically in the Medicaid program, over 60% of the dollars spent on Medicaid in this state are federal funds. It's the largest source of federal funding in the state. So anytime we make cuts, <laughs> we're also cutting, we're saying no to a bunch of federal money, which is something also to keep in mind as we talk about some of the decisions that have been made. Just, um, I know when I looked at this slide, <laughs> I'm going, what is N-R-E-G-M-T? Just a little footnote. Um, that stands for um, Natural Resources, Environment, Growth Management, and Transportation. So 
also very important um, that, um, that, that, that you can see the bulk is education and health and human services. Um, so I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip some of these slides. This is um, um, a, a, a pie chart reflecting specifically that allocation to health and human services. And you can see the different state agencies that are um, included in that allocation. Um, the biggest, of course, is to the Agency for Healthcare Administration, 78.6%. Um, that's the agency that runs the um, state Medicaid program. But it's really important to note that a lot of the clients that are served in some of these other agencies, like the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, Elders, Children and Families, that includes kids in the child welfare system, they are Medicaid beneficiaries. So lots of ACA budget is going to benefit um, those programs as well. So in terms of talking about the budget that just passed, I'm going to focus a lot on Medicaid, because it really is. Of that ACA allocation, it's, it's like out of $29 billion, it's $26 billion. So it really is the big 800,000-pound 8, 8, pound gorilla in the womb. Um, and this year, there was additional money, $600 million, to address the increased Medicaid caseload, which is continuously growing. Um, Medicaid is that E word, word, an entitlement program. So for the most part, people cannot be put on a waiting list. If they're eligible for the program, they qualify and they, and they get a card. And um, they have, um, at least on paper, access to services. There are some little exceptions to that relating to long-term care, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but there were investments made for caseload growth, hospital reimbursement, which <laughs> could be a 15-minute digression. Hopefully that's not anything I'm doing, um, which I'm not going to take you down that rabbit hole. But it's a very arcane and controversial subject and takes a lot of bandwidth up um, during the session. And that's um, in large part because the reimbursement rates under Medicaid are so low. and and we have very uh, high rates of uninsured people, which adds to the uncompensated care burden for hospitals. So it's quite a hot topic, and if people are interested, I'm happy to talk more about that um, during the Q&A or reception. <laughs> um, mental health and substance abuse. Um, of course, that was a very hot topic this session. There was lots of press and visibility brought to the opioid crisis. That's claiming over 5,000, claiming the lives of over 5,000 Floridians every year. Um, and there were also investments made um, around school-based mental health services. And again, that was in reaction to um, the Parkland shooting um, uh, in Broward County. So, but the experts will tell you this is a drop in the bucket um, in terms of mental health investment. And, um, you know, being ranked at 50th in terms of our um, uh, national ranking on investments in mental health, we have a long way to go. Um, I put the, uh, another, um, really it was continued funding for the Breast and Cervical <coughs> Cancer Treatment Program, which is a relatively small program in this state. It's for uninsured women who um, need um, screening and treatment. Um, this program actually was uh, threatened with very deep cuts this session um, and at the 11th hour was saved. So um, this is an example of, and we'll talk more about potential items on the chopping block as money might tighten. So long-term care, um, these are some highlights, and sorry about too many words on this slide, but um, this involves what are the investments that were made in nursing home care and also home and community-based services. 
Um, and there were, uh, on, the, on the nursing home front, there was an increase in nursing home uh, reimbursement of 130 million. Um, and another bright spot was that, and this is on the very last bullet, there was an increase in something called the personal needs allowance. Um, I know Bob talked about how one client's story can make a huge difference on policy, and this, this really grows out of one story. There was a woman in the panhandle who was in a nursing home, and there was a legislator who was visiting the nursing home, and she related her story, which is when you're um, on Medicaid and in a nursing home, most of your income has to be paid over to the nursing home for room and board. And the states have some discretion about how, where they set the bar for a personal needs allowance, which is how much the resident can keep back for items that aren't covered by room and board, like clothing, um, toiletries, um, a gift for a grandchild, just you know, things we don't even think about that if you're turning all your money over to a facility. And so she raised this issue with this legislator, who was a very conservative legislator from the panhandle. And he took this on. He championed this issue. And it had been, for 50 years, it had been $30 per month. That was the personal needs allowance. A couple years ago, um, after this legislator's efforts, um, it got raised to $105. And then last year, they actually threatened to cut it back again. And there was, fortunately, a lot of um, advocacy around that. So this year, really at the 11th hour and very much under the radar screen, all of a sudden, in the General Appropriations Act, where all those great policy decisions seem to be made, they increased this allowance to $130 a month, which just is, makes a huge difference. And, people's quality of life. So that's, that's really, I love that story because it really shows how just connecting policymakers with what's really going on on the ground is so critical. And of course, social workers have a huge, huge role in that. Um, let me talk a little bit about home and community-based services. Um, less of a bright spot. We have, on our, our major program providing home and community-based services, it's a Medicaid waiver program, which means that um, it's not an entitlement program. So the state decides how many slots that they will um, have available for people to get into this program. And you can see we have a waiting list of almost 50,000 for that program. Um, that $6.4 billion, by the way, this is a footnote, um, goes to Medicaid managed care plans, like what Bob was talking about, primarily for-profit um, entities. So they've really taken over the whole, um, the major part of these services. Um, there was no additional money allocated this year to address that waiting list. And what they did is instead, they added some money to generally to programs that get no federal funding, just general revenue funds um, that are important for um, people in the community. But as you can see, the waiting lists are substantial for those programs. We're talking about community care for the elderly, which provides a more limited range of services than would be available under the Medicaid waiver program. Um, home care for the elderly is, is, provides a small stipend to caregivers. Um, and then uh, Alzheimer's serves people in the community with Alzheimer's. But I saw a projection actually from the Florida Council of Aging that this, these funds would only really open up the services to about 340 more people. So when you're talking about where we are on the waiting list, it, it truly is a drop in the bucket. The biggest cut in Medicaid um, was to something called retroactive Medicaid eligibility, um, kind of an arcane terminology that um, it's too bad because it sort of disguises how important it is for people. What this does is if you apply for Medicaid and you were actually eligible 
up to three months prior to your month of application, you can get coverage for those back three months. And this is particularly important for people who all of a sudden are struck by some kind of catastrophic illness. You know, all of a sudden they have a stroke or cancer or they're in a car accident. And prior to that time, they would not qualify for Medicaid. They only become Medicaid eligible once they have a severe disability. So Congress passed this provision in, in the Medicaid statute um, many years ago, and, and the purpose still holds true today. Um, it's to protect people for, you know, when they're in this moment of crisis, they're not in a place where they even can apply for Medicaid or even know that they could be eligible. Well, the Florida legislature, again, at the 11th hour, they were sort of looking around for money because they wanted to address, I, I call them, and this is not to minimize the importance, but the crisis du jour, very reactive. You know, we're going to fund opioid, combating the opioid crisis, and we're going to fund school safety um, because of the Parkland shooting. And so they just looked around and they said, okay, well, this is something where we could save $98 million. Now, about $60 million of that is federal funds, but it did include um, state uh, funds of uh, about $36 million. And so they decided to eliminate that coverage, and it specifically impacts, it doesn't impact, they excluded pregnant women and children, which is good, but when we talk about Florida's really lean Medicaid program, because there's very few people on the program that are, and this comes up in the work requirements discussion, we have very few people on the program that are able-bodied working age people. Most of the people, other, most of the people on the program are children, over two million children out of a four million um, um, person program. Um, and then the rest are people with severe disabilities and, and seniors. And so this cut really targets them. And because this is a requirement in law, the, the legislature has authorized our Medicaid agency to go ask permission from the federal government to allow them to do this. And I think Bob had spoken earlier about you know, there may not be movement in Congress to change the Medicaid law, but there's a lot of stuff that the Trump administration is doing through its executive agencies to make or try to Im implement big changes. So this is a provision that um, would likely be approved by um, the, the feds. Um, it is... Um, um, something that is in litigation in, an, in another state where they're trying to do this. So um, we're hopeful that even though it's passed the legislature that it may still be in play to beat back on this. So, so stay tuned. Um, I'm just looking at my time. Um, I want to talk a bit about some of the, the substantive legislation that passed um, that affects seniors and people with disabilities. There's an excellent uh, website, uh, legislative website, where you can get more information about all these bills, uh, drill down into the bill history, their bill analyses, and that will really give you more insight into what was the motivation for passing these particular pieces of legislation. Um, so. Many of you probably already heard that we that one of the bills that was passed relates to emergency generators in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, and that of course was in reaction to the the deaths um, in in um, a Broward nursing home after Irma um, from overheating, um, and so after that the. Um, uh, executive agencies at the governor's direction passed some emergency rules and those rules had to be approved by the legislature and, be, and they were approved and basically it requires these facilities to have emergency generators um, to be able to keep um, temperatures no higher than 81 degrees um, if, if the power is off. Um, 
The second bill relates to the opioid crisis, and we talked about there was some new money that was appropriated to um, increase treatment services, including Medicaid-assisted um, um, uh, uh, medications to combat overdoses, um, and um, uh, but in addition to the extra monies, there were some restrictions that were put in place that were controversial with um, medical providers and some patient groups, and that limits the amount of time that um, a doctor can prescribe opioids um, and without the patient having to go back into the doctor's office um, to get a new prescription. And of course, we're talking about people who can be uh, in severe pain. There were some exceptions made for cancer patients, um, people who are terminally ill, and those with traumatic injuries. Um, and then finally, we talked a little bit that there were new monies that were appropriated for school-based mental health services, a new $69 million um, allocation. Um, and hopefully, you know, th this is, these are funds that will flow to all of the school districts. It's still, when you, you look at education funding and everything else that um, they're trying to do to serve students, this sounds like a lot of money, but again, it's a drop in the bucket. Um, just a couple more bills that passed, something called direct primary care agreements, which this is um, building on um, the leadership, legislative leadership's um, desire to make health care, getting health care more like shopping around on a marketplace. And so the intent of this bill, and they, this, it, this was a several year effort to get it passed, and the, the doctors were very, very supportive of this, but the, the notion is that patients can go out and shop around for a primary care doctor and negotiate with them their own agreements around a monthly premium and what services will be covered. Now, that all, you know, so the idea is eliminate the insurance companies from that equation. So there's, you know, some of that sounds good, but there's some major concerns with this. Um, first of all, taking it out of the insurance code means taking away a lot of consumer protections. That's what's in the insurance code to, to protect people in, you know, going in the marketplace to buy health insurance. Um, the other thing is the premiums that were sort of projected, you know, and there was everything from fifty to hundred dollars a month. I mean, we have over half a million um, uninsured Floridians that are living below poverty level, um, there's no way, this is completely inaccessible for them. There's no way they could afford to pay for that. And then of course, if somebody needed some kind of specialty treatment, um, this is just intended for primary care services. So they could have this and no other coverage and they'd be out of luck if they got struck by a terrible illness. Um, I'm going to skip over the prescription one for a minute and go to the adult exploitation um, bill that passed that I think would be of particular interest to this group. Um, it's modeled on um, what exists already in law for domestic violence victims. Um, this allows people who are victims of adult exploitation or at imminent risk of exploitation to go to court and get an injunction for protection. Um, and it allows the court to um, not only enter an injunction, but also to order an abuser outside of uh, joint residence that they might be sharing with the exploited person, and also to deal with a joint asset situation where assets can be provided to the um, exploited person. So that's um, an exciting new remedy that's um, available for um, elders subject to elders and people with disabilities subject to abuse. So let's, in the remaining time, talk a little bit about some of the threats that are on the horizon that we need to keep our eye on. And um, 
Bob had mentioned this notion of uh, this, these proposals to cap funding in the Medicaid program. And this was a very hot topic um, during 2017 when the federal budget negotiations were going on. It's been quieter this year, but it's certainly bubbling under the surface, and there's a lot of interest still among congressional leadership to do this. Um, it would have devastating consequences for, um, uh, particularly for, for seniors and people with disabilities. So let me take a, a bit of, just a couple minutes to explain this, and I'm gonna skip the next couple slides. Um, so Medicaid is a program that's jointly um, administered and funded by the state and the federal government. Um, and as you've heard, uh, over 60% over of the funding is federal funding. Um, while most of the beneficiaries are children, um, more than half of the money spent in the program is for seniors and people with disabilities. Not surprising, they're, surprisingly, they're, they're um, a, a more costly, generally, um, population than children. And right now, the way the funding works for Medicaid is if we have more people that come into the program or higher need for services or higher cost services that come down the line, um, and mentioned on here, you know, opioid epidemics, Zika, HIV, natural disasters. I mean, one thing that came down the pike recently was their new um, amazing medications for hepatitis C that are, are expensive, but certainly less costly than somebody having to go for a, a liver transplant. And so um, these were, these are just examples of the kind of things that can come up that are unanticipated where if we have greater needs, we get more federal money. And that is really the, the intent of these proposals is the intent is purely to save federal dollars. Um, you know, and just push this all down to the state to have to deal with increasing needs. And so there's been talk about block grants and per capita caps. Either way, it's, it, the, the vision is we would, there would be a limited pot of federal funds that would be available for the state to meet growing health care needs and costs. Um, the other thing about Florida is historically we have a very um, low per person um, expenditure for Medicaid. Not surprisingly, when you see how we rank on all these other indicators, we're not spending you know, nearly as much on Medicaid as, as other states, given, given our size. Um, so, this, so if we went to one of these capped funding um, structures, we would be locked in to our historically low, low um, per person expenditures. And of course, Congress could decide to dial down that formula at any point. Um, so we, I wrote a paper which um, um, is referenced in the materials about how, how optional services and optional coverage groups under Medicaid could particularly be impacted in Florida. And what that means, it's just like it sounds. Florida has the flexibility to offer certain services and to cover certain categories of people um, uh, and these are considered optional. And Florida, like all the other states, have decided to provide a lot of these services and coverage groups, because in the end, it does save money. Um, but all of these programs could be threatened if we are all of a sudden are stuck with cap funding. There would definitely be a need to do deep cuts. Um, so let's, and, and one of the handouts is just, um, it gives some profiles of the types of beneficiaries that could really be hurt. Um, certainly long-term care services, home and community-based services, which are a big chunk of our Medicaid budget, would have a, a large bullseye on it for potential cuts. Um, and this, one of the groups that's, impacted is there's um, a group called dual eligibles. That's people who get both Medicare and Medicaid. These are low-income Medicare beneficiaries. And the reason why the Medicaid's so important 
is because there's some really critical services that uh, Medicare does not provide, um, a range of long-term um, you know, home services, um, uh, dental, vision, and hearing services. So that's all considered <coughs> optional services, and those services have, in the past, been on the chopping block in Florida. Um, so it's not uh, too much of a, uh, a leap to think that they would also be at risk um, if we get stuck with federal caps. Um, there's also, we don't cover low-income um, seniors on Medicaid um, just because they're living under poverty. And this is really, we, we cover people up to 88% of the poverty, guide, uh, poverty level, which is less than $800 a month. Um, that's kind of an arbitrary bar that's been set, and again, that's been driven by money, not any policy rationale. We used to cover seniors up to 100% of poverty, and that bar has just been getting lowered over the years. Now, in contrast, we cover children up to 138% of poverty. That is because federal law mandates that. Federal law does not mandate that on the senior side. So that's a group that is very much at risk. Um, I'm gonna quickly, because I know we're running out of time, another threat, and you've probably, you heard a little bit earlier about this, the, the decision, Florida has, has not expanded its Medicaid program as it could do under the Affordable Care Act. And before a Supreme Court decision, it was required under the Affordable Care Act. Um, it's now optional, and Florida is one of 18 states that has not expanded its program. We're losing out on a 90% federal match for that program. It was higher. It was up to 100%. We've already lost that. So we're passing up billions of federal dollars by not doing this. And we did a recent study that shows the state would actually save over half a billion dollars a year if it expanded its Medicaid program. Um, so I think we, we, we only have, the, the more time that goes by that we don't do that, the more our uncompensated care costs are gonna go up. Um, it affects all of us. It's not just people who lack insurance. And this is just, um, I can talk later if you want about this, a graphic of how crazy our Medicaid coverage groups are in terms of income eligibility. It's all over the map. That's all politically driven. <laughs> no policy rationale. Um, finally, I'm gonna close up by saying, this is another threat, certainly not the least. This is a proposal that's being floated that voters will get to decide um, a constitutional amendment that will be on the state ballot in November. And what it would do is it would require a two-thirds vote by each house in the legislature, both the, um, the Senate and the House, um, before there can be any uh, increases in revenue. Um, and and, and before they could eliminate any tax exemptions. And we've got a lot of crazy tax exemptions that have been driven very much by special interests. Um, my favorite is ostrich feed is exempted from taxes. Um, this would tie um, policymakers' hand with, hands. It would make it incredibly difficult for us to raise up on some of those horrible <laughs> indicators that I showed earlier. And um, we have experience, Oklahoma passed something similar um, and in 1992, and they went 26 years without raising revenue once. And they just last month passed something, but this of course is after deep, deep cuts. So it should stay on high alert about that, um, stay informed, and um, as Bob would say, don't panic. Um, so that concludes my remarks and look forward to answering your questions. So a couple of things as I switch the slides over. Um, we've asked Amy if, to come in and talk a little bit just about what does this all mean 
to the community? Um, what does federal policy, what does state policy mean at the local level and to the residents in Central Florida? We're gonna, uh, we have to do a quick mic change. Bob, if you, I think you're in this one and Ann's in the other. Um, and if anyone has any more questions, just kind of raise them in the air and Tracy and I will come grab them and walk them up to you. And you're gonna take that, right? Just give um, Ann a few seconds to go. Hi, you can, is my mic on? Everybody can hear me? Um, all right, so you guys are here for a reason. So one of the things I want to stress here is that um, in some of these talks, each of us do make a difference. We do have a role. You're not here by accident. So as you're hearing some of this information, if you can think in the world that you live in, what action can you take to make life better for an aging person? I hope you take this as a um, kind of an inspirational, motivational uh, push to take some action. Here are the two hot seats. We have 15 questions. And we have 45 minutes to answer them. So um, some I'll direct to both of you, some I'll direct to uh, individually to each of you. And when we're running out of time, I'll kind of do this, not to be rude, but just to be efficient and try to get to all your questions. First one we have for Bob and Ann, what communities are doing a great job in advocating for needs of their elder residents and what are these communities doing that makes them special? Start? Yes, okay. Bob. Um, well, you know, places that are uh, designated in the age-friendly capacity, there's, there's different movements. You have the age-friendly, you have livable communities, you have villages, you have all these things, which by the way, at some point, they need to come together to one, have one term so everybody can work together on that. Um, but when they, when they use that framework, um, you know, like places like Chicago or New York City have them, uh, there's, I know there's some in Florida. Um, one of the keys that I have discovered in uh, one aspect of this, because I sit on a panel that judges the best intergenerational community in America, that's done every year, that's one of the keys, is having a community for all ages in literal sense, so that you are utilizing the talents of all people, uh, you're providing services in a coordinated way. Um, so there's probably a listing, I would think you might go to the ARP website, um, they have listings of some of the better communities that they're supportive of. Uh, going forward, but you know, there's there's a lot of them, more than I could rattle off here, probably. All right, do you have any, Anne? Um, you know, I think, and this may not respond to the question, but there needs to be in this state a whole lot more resources for elder advocacy. I mean, and of course, that helps our communities. Um, we really, given we're Florida and our elder population. There's very little, and if you look at other states, the capacities to, and I'm talking about, you know, whether it's associations, nonprofits, mm -hmm. um, and, and linking up um, the, the advocates with people on the ground who really know what's going on and translating that to policymakers. I mean, I think that's essential for creating better communities for elders in this state. Thank you. On the same, on the same uh, vein, given the limited funding in elder service programs in Florida, are there examples of partnerships, senior programs that we can replicate in our community? Well, I know one of, and, and, and I, again, I come out of, of this legal services world, and one of the things that um, has been um, intra, of interest is something called medical um, legal partnerships where they're actually putting um, attorneys, for example, in hospitals or in other kind of medical um, settings, uh, aging settings, to work collaboratively with other professionals and, of course, the, the person that needs the services, and to really sort of have this brain trust of bringing all these professionals together to figure out how do we best serve this person. So I think, you know, there's these different models out there that um, can be looked at. One that, one that would jump right to mind is in a number of communities, including in Florida, multidisciplinary teams that deal in elder abuse prevention are great models. Okay? Well, you take all the people that should have a stake in trying to prevent elder abuse and put them together, healthcare community, law enforcement, faith-based, whatever, where they exist, and there's hundreds of them around the country. 
Um, that's a good model of how to put people together around a common purpose. And I think I'd also take this opportunity on um, the 13th annual World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. June 15th. He, June 15th. Right. And where is that going to be held? Community United Methodist Church in Castleberry. Excellent. Good work. Good work. All right, aside from local county government and state congressional representatives, whose coattails would you tug on to facilitate a town hall in under and inefficiently served communities where service delivery flaws and creation of culturally and socially inclusive programs are designed and appropriately implemented can be addressed? I know, aren't these great questions? Yeah, really. really. Put your hand up. Anybody who uh, your question raised, you should put your hand up so you can get a, you know, one of these. Yeah. Want me to jump in? Yeah. Sure, please. absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think, and especially at the state level, our state legislators do not hear enough from people who are really impact, either impacted or people who work with folks that are um, the uh, trying to get services. And so it's always very interesting to me when, when I'm in Tallahassee talking to legislators that they truly how uninformed they are. I mean, not purposely. They just don't have um, the capacity to know all the intricacies of some of these programs we all work with and some of the, the pitfalls and how certain policy really is impacting people. And so I think... Um, in terms of t tugging on coattails, oh, thank I'm you. Hand you this microphone because I think there's something with yours going on. So, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. All right. <laughs> yeah, I, I would urge people to, especially when their legislators are home, when their session is not going on, because it's very hard to get their attention during session. But they all have, you know, offices in the districts. You've got a unique perspective. Um, and, um, you know, I think if they see you as a resource um, and a source of information and expertise, they, they, will, they will call on you. So I, I urge people to make those connections. I also know that, um, and, and Mimi, help me remember this, there is a day that you can meet your legislator and they have it downtown Orlando and all the legislators are there. Uh, I went to one this year. There were 88 people there to testify, give their three-minute spiel to the legislators. Out of 88 people, I was the only one talking about aging. 88. So that was just a simple thing. It took three minutes um, of preparation to make sure that I could get my point across. But you would be amazed at how natural resources in the environment and children are representative, and nobody is out front talking about aging. So you can be a hero. You can be an entrepreneur. There's so much opportunity. One of the questions in here talked about what you can do to make aging uh, industry more uh, interesting to the millennial. It is ripe with opportunity, ripe with it. And if we're looking at partnerships, those of you who are technology-based, Uber, all the, they need you. They need you giving them ideas as to how we can serve older people with private industry and politics together. It's a huge entrepreneurial opportunity. Right, I, I would just add one positive and one cynical comment. The positive is that on the coattail issue, faith-based people, you know, uh, elected people have pastors, rabbis, you know, whatever it may be. Sometimes they can be a great asset to opening a door, whatever it is. The cynical part of me says, you know, particularly in the federal legislature, the donors. Build a relationship with those people who give money to these candidates because that probably at least opens the door perhaps a little faster. All right, next question. Medicaid block grants have been proposed for many years going back to at least George W. Bush. Do you feel it is more likely now than before? Well, I'm going to answer it based on do we actually see it become law? Probably not. Um, will it get discussed more? Will it get analyzed more? Will it get more support than it has in the past? I would say that's true, but can it go to the finish line? I would be very surprised. However, let's see what happens in November as well. Um, you know, I mean, if the, if the Democrats take over one of the two branches of Congress, no way you're going to see a Medicaid block grant. And if the, if the majority shrinks, uh, for, for the Republicans, no way you're going to see it. If for some reason they expand their majorities in the House and the Senate, that it might be a bit more likely. All right. 
Uh, will Medicare ever, ever cover private duty home care to keep older adults out of institutional care? <laughs> uh, stump the panel. Yeah. We don't know. Will it ever? Yeah. Question? <laughs> ever. Well, I mean, it, it covers some home care now. Does this private, the question was private duty. Private duty home, home care. care. Um, you, you know, if anything, the home, home health industry under Medicare is under siege right now, in general, uh, with cutbacks and, and reductions. And so, somewhere along the line, and again, th this, is, this happens in, in certain healthcare sectors over the course of time, a couple of really bad apples could mess up a whole industry. Mm -hmm. You know, we had this in the nursing home space, you've had it in the home health space. You know, there's got to be some stronger commitment to cleaning up and having good, solid uh, agencies so you can go make a case before the Congress to expand that coverage. But um, expanding Medicare right now, um, other than Medicare Advantage, uh, doesn't look too promising. All right, so we all know that healthcare is capitalized. So are there any working groups that are out there trying to change the healthcare capitalized system to a system that pays for a healthy outcome? Re the, the, the last part of that question. Just Are the there question. any working groups that, right now, oh. healthcare is capitalized? Capitated, you mean? No, 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 no. Capitalized? Um, the more they do, the more money they make. Oh, oh, okay, right. So is anybody out there, any working groups out there changing that model to a model where, where providers Physicians, hospitals are paid for a healthy outcome. What? Go ahead. Well, Florida, as you heard, most of the long term care um, is through Medicaid managed care, and that's paid through um, capitated payments. So they get, per beneficiary, the plans get um, a certain amount each month to take care of that person. Now, so in theory, <laughs> you would think that that would be a model for trying to keep people healthy. Um, there, there are some uh, right. There's some mixed yeah. uh, opinions about right. And right. I think um, you know, and people go on and off programs, um, and I don't know. You know, the metrics, how you measure all of that, is also a challenge. And I think it's very much kind of an evolving science. Um, right, is anybody working on it? Is any, do you know well, of any groups well, that are doing that? Well, certainly our Medicaid agency is struggling with that. I mean, all the Medicaid agencies across the country are. Um, I'm sure, you know, the managed care plans, they have their own association. Um, they're certainly trying to figure out how, you know, they mm -hmm. keep people healthy and make a profit. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not aware of anybody else. Well, I, think there's, I mean, there's a lot of think tanks that have ideas to put forward, and there's a lot of people who, you know, but I think, I think they're going in that direction. Uh, I would call your attention to the Secretary Azar today was giving us an important speech in Washington, the new Secretary of Health and Human Services, about the value-based approach uh, versus volume and, and how they're going to build their reimbursement structures around those kind of outcomes. And I, I think if you look carefully at, at that, and they're loosening to some degree of Medicare Advantage um, choices, um, they may be moving in that direction slowly but surely. And, and obviously, there's no idea that comes out that isn't given input from somebody. Mm -hmm. So whoever, whoever is considered the most reliable think tanks for the Trump administration, those are probably where the ideas are coming from, like Heritage Foundation, people like that. All right, thank you. We have two questions on transportation. This one's for Anne. Um, how is it that legislator has lumped transportation in with the environment? Is there a law or some formula or matrix that was designed at the federal level which categorizes it with the environment? Or was this, <laughs> a little sorry, or was this loveliness decided by our state? Yeah, I, that, Isn't that funny? That pie Do I misunderstand chart. the meaning of natural resources? <laughs> no, that pie chart was probably misleading. I mean, there are different state agencies for each of those areas, and I think it was just lumped together um, for the purposes of that pie chart. Um, but I have to, it's not, those are not agencies where I pay a lot of attention to their budgets. 
Um, and so we'd have to actually look at the General Appropriations Act. But there are, there's a department, Florida Department of Transportation, Natural Resources. So yes, I, I, I wouldn't read too much into that <laughs> sliver of the pie. All right, here's another one that's probably for Bob. It's regarding transportation also. Regarding non-emergency medical transportation, Medicare usually only allows limited transportation unless dual enrolled with Medicaid. What can be done to increase or make unlimited trips available for Medicare recipients? Well, I suspect that like anything else, if you're gonna to try to make uh, you know, changes in, Medi in Medicare policy, um, you know, you've, got to make the, you've got to make the case on what the potential benefits are uh, for the individual and if, if there's any potential cost savings that would come to Medicare by allowing that versus something else. You know, by not covering this, it, but they do, and, and they cover that instead, does that cost more? It's, it's about doing some kind of analysis to demonstrate that there's value in doing that. And I suspect if you can put that data together and have that kind of analysis, you'll be, at least be listened to. Right. She gives this example, um, especially for dialysis patients, recipients who run out of trips have enormous difficulty getting to their medical appointments without transportation assistance. Right. All right. What is being done in Washington to help seniors with living options, for example, 55 plus apartments? Orlando has an 18 month to three year waiting list. Uh, seniors can't afford one bedroom apartments. Well, sadly enough, uh, the most recent thing that came out of uh, the, the Washington and the administration on housing was to try to raise the rents uh, of people in Section 8 uh, in low income housing. Um, a uh, proposal by the Secretary of, of HUD that probably doesn't have real good chance of, of passing. Um, I think the funding uh, decisions that have been made in, uh, honestly, on a bipartisan basis, the Obama people didn't really do that much in housing either in terms of what they could have done on support of it. Um, there needs a whole new conversation uh, and advocacy on the issue of housing because mm -hmm. it has been put in a silo for some bizarre reason, even though it is, mm -hmm. it is essential to so many elements of, mm -hmm. of people's lives. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the, in the, I mean, again, if we could get the developers of the world who are making a fortune um, with these 55 plus communities and these, you know, live like you're never going to age communities and, and that kind of stuff, <laughs> if they would sort of come in and start to get involved in policy on a broader scale um, with uh, housing, you know, maybe we would see some, some different yeah. results. Um, let's see, you know, I mean, we, we all try up to, to work on that, but it's a, it's a struggle. I can't figure out why we're not doing better in that front, honestly. Yeah, right. Private, private, public partnership. Yeah, maybe. right. Uh, for Bob, although the expansion of supplemental services is a new thing, the old thing that continues to be a challenge, and more specifically for those who are trying to remain independent and at home, transportation assistance and caregiver assistance still remain uncovered for either fee-for-service and advantage programs. Is there any move to make this a priority? I suspect that there is. I mean, I think um, one program that comes to mind that needs to get refunded, there's a push on, it's called Money Follows the Person program, which is, a, which is a, an important sort of caregiver support program. Um, the Independence at Home program that was put under the uh, Medicare program just got a, an extension and expansion under it. Um, my guess is that, um, you know, the, the, the push is going to continue um, more on the, on the Medicare Advantage side right now because for some reason, even, notwithstanding that unfortunate thing of yesterday, and, and, uh, which I do intend to write a blog about that when I get home, um, they have this belief that Medicare Advantage is the, test, is, is the testing ground right now to see what else we can cover to demonstrate better outcomes on health and, and services and so on. Um, and there are 300 some odd members of Congress who wrote, who co-signed a letter supporting continued rate, in, you know, rate increases for Medicare Advantage. So it shows they have bipartisan support. So I think where that tracks out is going to determine some of the future directions in Medicare. However, what you don't want to lose in the process, not everybody's in Medicare Advantage. And some of the things that are being offered through Medicare Advantage should also be offered under fee-for-service Medicare. So there's going to have to be a deeper discussion, but you've got to test it out someplace first. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that's where they're going to do it. Footnote on that, on the money follows the person. Um, people should know 
Florida had an opportunity to tap into that. Was that the competitive, did the, were they selected? Or the, it's an option for yeah. the state. Anyways, this is another example of Florida rejecting that opportunity. They decided, they firmly decided they were not going to tap in that money to provide more home and community-based services. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there would be more state funded Medicaid money for low-income seniors if we did not allow those with money and assets be approved for the Medicaid institutional care program or long-term care program. Right now, they're allowed to maneuver assets and benefit benefiting from Medicaid, thus not allowing low-income seniors to get the funds they need. Skilled long-term care beds are occupied with those on program who have assets. Well, that's kind of a general, that's a pretty broad question in some ways. I know what they're talking about. There is, you know, the, uh, the protection of assets and the transfer of assets and look back peers and all those things that, you know, that some people are skilled at uh, working with other law attorneys to, to achieve, um, you know, the best result they can, they can do. Um, you know, does it come at the expense of, of low income people? I don't, I'm not so sure that, that the correlation is that, that close. But I would say that um, you know it's 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 up to a state uh, to to some degree prioritize and ensure that the neediest get in first under a program. I mean, Medicaid is for the neediest, and it's there's categ categories of of neediness. I I I'm not sure I would agree with the premise of that of that question, um, but I don't have any data to back it up. To be mm -hmm. honest with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I know this has been a hot topic in some circles, and there, there have been efforts in, I don't remember exactly when, Bob may know this, to tighten up yeah. the rules in terms, because it used to be that they look back three years, now they look back five years. So they have, there have been efforts to tighten that up. I think it's, my personal view is that it's kind of greatly exaggerated how much this is really impacting the Medicaid program. The other thing is, this, a lot of people go into nursing homes, private pay, and then they exhaust all their funds and become Medicaid eligible. So you've got people who historically were not poor that um, become poor once they need those services. And then there are um, some of these um, um, ways to deal with assets. It does allow people with more moderate income to tap into the Medicaid program. And I, personally, I feel like the more people of, um, of more moderate means who see the value of the Medicaid program, and there are over 70 million people in the country, I think you said more than Medicare now. And you know, it's not, it really isn't just a poor people's program. I know it has that stigma attached to it, but it really um, extends beyond that, and, and particularly for people with disabilities. I mean, you have households where they have a, a child with a severe disability, and there are different programs now where the kids can get, um, it, it literally allows them to stay in home rather than being institutionalized if they um, can be on the Medicaid program, so. All right, here's an interesting one. Uh, how can we advocate universal medical admission forms to doctor offices, hospitals, so patients do not have to fill these over and mm -hmm. over and over again? It is overwhelming. Boy, yeah. <laughs> if I had that answer, I could make a lot of money, wouldn't I? You know, um, <sighs> you know I thought when we went to this movement on electronic health records that we were moving in yeah. somewhat in that direction, <laughs> and now there's a rebellion about electronic health mm -hmm. records. And so, you know, even if you think you've got a logical approach to do something, it doesn't mean one size is gonna fit all. Um, but I think, clearly, the problem is, is, is well known to people. The solution is not there, mm -hmm. because the solution um, needs to be adaptable through all types of, of uh, physician practices and things of that nature. So, I don't think anybody's quite got it yet. Yeah. It's, you know, I mean, but they have simplified the tax form a little bit, so maybe there's a, you know, maybe there's <laughs> hope that we could do that with medical forms too, right? Oh, 
uh, with the incredible increase in migrants and immigrants, who gets priority? How will residents be affected regarding qualification for benefits, home health care, long-term care? Well, there, there are pretty strict rules right now about who can qualify for, um, for Medicaid and some of the other um, public programs. And um, it, it is rather convoluted and arcane, but there, there are very detailed um, rules about different immigration statuses that can tap into public um, programs. And of course, that's all under the microscope right now. Um, Florida, a couple years ago, did opt into, there, there, had, there is a five-year bar for immigrants to be able to qualify um, for Medicaid, but there was an option for states to allow children um, to get coverage without waiting that five years, and the legislature um, decided to do that. And I think, you know, there were all kinds of good policy reasons why they landed at that place. Um, so um, I think it is very regulated right now, mm -hmm. and there's an awful lot of people who are excluded from coverage. But again, that all gets picked up by all of us through uncompensated care, which right. the Florida Chamber has estimated that for every insured person that goes into the hospital, that we're paying $2,000 per admission to cover uncompensated care costs. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to consider all of that. I think we've hit the top of the hour, the halfway mark of the hour. I want to thank everybody for coming. Ann and Bob, you've been a wealth of information. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you very much.